Bear with me one second. Right, um, recording has started. So um, Jenny has already extended a welcome, but let me extend my own welcome to everybody. Thank you for joining us for the launch of the report, The Value of Autonomous Rock. Um, Autonomous Rock, as you all know, probably better than me, was an important alternative hub located in the city of Ljubljana for almost 15 years. And the report evaluates the content, communities and activities of ROC over this period. Um, I'm really excited for the seminar that we have planned today. Um, I'm really excited to hear the discussion. Um, what we're going to have first is a short presentation from the authors of the report about their findings. And then we're going to move into a panel discussion um, of the report's findings and associated themes. So thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much for, um, for writing the report. It was a really fascinating read. I really enjoyed it. Um, I'll just introduce myself. My name is Kay Lawler. I'm a senior lecturer in law at Manchester Metropolitan University in Manchester, and I'll be chairing the session today. As I've said, the first uh, part of this seminar is going to be an introduction to the report by its authors before we move into the panel. So allow me to introduce the authors of the report. We have Dr. Jenny Canalopoulou from Manchester Law School, Manchester Metropolitan University and the Institute of Place Management. Dr. Nick Cosentunas from Manchester Metropolitan University and the Institute of Place Man Management. And Dr. Aidan Serra from IPOP the Institute za Politik Prostora in Ljubljana. Um, so thank you very much to uh, all three of you and I will mute myself and without further ado hand over to the report's authors. Thank you. Thank you very much Kay for the introduction. Hello everyone. So first uh, question obviously in the Slovenian minds would be why on earth two Greeks from Manchester are writing about Ljubljana? I would have the exact same question. Uh, uh, Nikos and I have been interested in investigating autonomous places in Europe and their relationship with, with law and their surrounding municipalities for a couple of years now, since 2014-2015. And after a stop in Mitilkova, we were familiarised with ROG uh, back in 2016 when we visited Ljubljana for the purposes of our research. For the first time as uh, academics, because we have had affiliations with the city and friends in Ljubljana from years before that, so we were aware of the city and its activities. And we decided to take a closer look at what's happening at Rogue because we were familiarised with it in 2016, which coincides with the period of the start of its decline, with the, with the big uh, occupation in 2016, the big class with the municipality on the streets that led progressively and steadily to its decline. And we decided to stop and investigate one of the last, perhaps, uh, spaces of this kind uh, in Slovenia and uh, see uh, what we can report about its contents, its activities. Uh, we were, uh, so we secured funding from the British Academy to investigate uh, Autonomous Ljubljana uh, and Rog more specifically, and we visited again in November 2019, where uh, little did we know it would be so close to the pandemic, obviously, and then the 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 collapse of of Rog and the demolition of the building by the municipality that happened earlier in January 2021. So we have been there to map out and research and investigate the last stages of Rog. And we wanted to take with this report a retrospective uh, view of what activity has been happening, what communities have been present, how the municipality and the institutions in Slovenia have treated uh, autonomous ROG, why did ROG collapse and what value, most importantly, did ROG produce that could be safeguarded for the future. So the report, uh, I, I hope you all had time to read the report focuses exactly uh, on these uh, contents. It, it, it starts obviously with um, introducing the story of Autonomous ROG since its inception uh, back in the early 2000s and then focuses primarily on the groups, the activities and the content uh, 
that was held within it, on which Aidan um, will uh, comment uh, on a, in the future. Uh, in a few seconds, no, not in the future. Um, even though my background is in law, I'm a legal scholar, and I was interested in investigating the relationship between autonomous places and the legal system, and how, even though some places are squatted, they're still appreciated either by the status quo or by the surrounding seats or the public. Um, I teamed up with Nikos, who is an expert in place management, representing the Institute of Place Management at our university, to bring together our expertise in law and urban studies and see what findings we, we could get at. Uh, so Nikos would like to take it from here. Uh, yes, thank you very much, Jenny. So yeah, I would say a few words on this because as Jenny said, we are not really the expert. So the, the experts in actually the location, we, it, you know, we had uh, we had an appreciation, obviously, of uh, of urban squats and how this materialized in Ljubljana. And it was very fascinating from the start that we were there in 2016. We were actually uh, doing research in Metalkova. Uh The proximity of uh, of the cultural and urban and uh, alternative activity in such as a few um, hundred meters apart from each other. So the whole area of Ljubljana, th that was, it was very interesting that the bulk, you know, the bulk of activity between Metelkova and Rogue and maybe other, even in even other locations that we don't, that we haven't been able to explore. It was, it was a very unique situation like th that was happening, especially in the first time that we saw it in 2016. In 2019, it was a very, it was kind of a different case. Um, we came across, uh, obviously, uh, in, in in a different situation in Rogue. It wasn't as lively as it was in the summer of 2016, and uh, and Metelkova seemed to be a bit more institutional institutionalized than it was in the past in the past three years. And and that was the interesting part, and the and that was one of the interesting uh, things that we uh, discovered during our visit in, in Rogue. Obviously, in Rogue, that in this period, uh, it, it, it was it was a bit, it was struggling a bit in terms of financial uh, struggles pretty much. Obviously, we visited during the winter where other uh, problems occur, occurred usually, but we would still find like, you know, fire and the, in, in the participants and, you know, that, uh, that idea of trying to manage the situation with uh, with what was happening at the time in Rogue, and particularly, you know, with the organizations that were more active at that point in, for example, Ambassada Rogue, uh, Circusarna, obviously the skaters groups were there, the skating community groups was there from, uh, from 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 probably the first year, and and what uh, and what is probably what we're going to discuss in a bit and hopefully the experts will help you know that it's like why why rogue failed and uh, we, we're not the experts on answering that but we can see at the macro level in the macroeconomic level of why these places in general maybe are not really accepted in the in the mainstream urban culture so so it was pretty obvious that, uh, especially at the point of our last visit in November 2019, that there was that perception that uh, that things uh, were not really uh, that things that happen in, in Rogue are and the organizing, the organizing and the continuation was struggling a bit, and that had to do with also the pressures from 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 the municipality, maybe pressures from the government, which culminated obviously in the eviction a year later with the with the with the premise of the pandemic and and how the rogue uh, was kind of diminishing especially in material terms because you cannot because it was really hard to sustain this level of production after all this uh, all, all these years so so what so what we were trying to do with this report is not uh, doing it's not like we're not making a funeral. It's not a eulogy of Rogue, uh, but is it's probably an, it's probably we want to 
what we want to do with this approach is to understand why this pro these alternative spaces are suffering in this time and what can we do in order to sustain as jane said uh the value that's been created in that and how we can actually maybe you know make our make the make these uh cities make these spaces very re relevant to the city to the con to the concept of the city again um so i think that's my kind of my two cents if you if you like from what we did um you know in in Ljubljana, uh, especially on, the, on our last visit, and hopefully the report uh, uh, highlights this. I will now probably want to give the uh, for Aiden. Give this, so Aiden, yes. Nikos Jerry, thank you. Uh, yeah, the first thing uh, when Jenny and uh, Nikos invited me to to collaborate with them, uh, the first question I asked myself was, what happens in Rook? Even though I was uh, I was visiting Rook uh, uh, regularly, um, I, and uh, quite some of my friends uh, did so too, no one really knew, no one really had a larger larger picture of, of uh, more than a couple of activities that took place. We all knew about the activity that we visited and maybe the neighboring one, uh, uh, but not much more. Uh, and uh, of course, uh, plenty of interviews were were done. Uh, within this research with people who are in charge of particular places or, or, or are active in Rook in some or, or another way or active in the uh, municipality or, or um, some other uh, uh, level. And uh, uh, what, it, what, what could be pointed out uh, quite easily is that no one had a complete picture about what goes on in Rook. Even people that were in charge of a place in Rook, they knew about their place, a neighboring one and stuff, but no one had a larger picture, which is which is a, not a very big surprise if we take into account of how large Rook was as a squad. You don't see squad of this size very often. I don't actually. I think you don't even. Uh, the, the, there are only. A few, I mean, maybe a few of them of this size, because uh, Rook was really was really um, uh, uh, quite massive in terms of how much space it provided for different uh, communities. You know. Um, so the first question was, of course, uh, uh, how to categorize all these uh, contents, programs, activities that were taking place in Rook. Uh, and of course, I'm quite aware of that, that because we were doing this at the later stage of Rook, we have probably missed some of the activities because some activities started maybe in 2012, 2013, and then faded out in a couple of years, you know. Uh, but however, we, we divided these uh, activities and programs that took place in Rook in broadly three categories. The first one, obviously, would be arts and culture, galleries, uh, uh, clubs, uh, uh, and so on. The second one would be political, social, and uh, civil life related programs and contents, like the social center or ambassada, uh, uh, um, and so on. And the third uh, category would be physical activity and well being. Like for example, uh, the skate park was the larger, uh, the largest place in Rook probably, uh, and of course it dealt with with uh, skateboarding, uh, BMXing, roller skating, uh, and so on. So this is how we divided the, the the contents. And of course, the second question was, what what value they present for the city, the city? What social value they generate? And um, here we had again uh, three levels. Uh, the first one was. Uh, that they uh, uh, generate value for the city and the inhabitants of Ljubljana in general, like for example, uh, 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 skate park did. And the second one was they deliver value to marginalized groups that are unable to find the comparable content on service elsewhere. Here I can give you an example of the Erased, for example. Erased is a is a, a, a group of people. Um, who were erased from the national register in the beginning of, of the 90s because they were from other former republics of Yugoslavia. And because of that, they were actually stateless, I, I could say, I suppose, and that limited all other aspects of their lives. And here it was migrants, different kind of minorities, and so on. And the third level um, is uh, 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 places that were used for legitimate or sometimes illegitimate personal benefit. However, 
especially for the for the first two groups the of places the generated or value for 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 the inhabitants of the city or some value for for marginalized groups that could not find this kind of service elsewhere the question is why weren't these these uh, uh, um, contents or activities recognized as such if they deliver value and the second question uh, uh, from that would be why weren't they supported in some way if they deliver this kind of value and the thing that that um, uh, uh, I think is is the the most important question is how come we were able to 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 destroy rook before we even asked ourselves what goes on in rook what value it generates and to form some kind of a maybe dynamic air hive and with the dynamic I mean that all the rook was never static you know uh, it changed activities changed the attendance of different activities changed and that it would make quite some sense to make this kind of a, a, a dynamic archive, archive and to support, I suppose, uh, different activities that generate uh, value. The second thing, I think it's quite relevant, uh, especially in the media, uh, when reading about Rock, particularly in January and February, at the time of the second eviction of Rock, and even in the time of the first eviction of Rock, which took place in 2016, I believe, June. Um, it was often said like, this is rock, you know, rock is good, rock is bad, rock is like this and stuff like that. But the thing is, as I said, rock was much too large to, to, to put, uh, to, to stick a single identity on it. Rook, I mean, the, the activities within rock was so, so different between each other that it's really hard to describe rock with a single, single uh, um, uh, identity. And um, because the set of, of uh, 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 how the places were used or, or, or what, what was offered in Rook was so diverse that uh, um, to make it so simple, it's quite wrong, in my opinion, you know. But on the other hand, uh, this diversity is also something that all creative cities are, are craving uh, uh, for, you know. Uh, so here I find it, it's quite, uh, it's a pity we haven't uh, um, take a look of, of, of all the, at all these different uh, uh, kind of activities in, in all this diversity of rock in relation to a potential creative uh, uh, center that is about to be built on the, in this area. And uh, the third thing I'd like to mention is rock it's not the only uh, empty place uh, in Ljubljana. And this I mean in the past tense. Rock was an empty place before it was, it was uh, uh, um, squatted somehow a uh, uh, decade ago or even more. And uh, um, because of that, uh, I also feel that it would be quite relevant to learn more from Rook. Uh, because, okay, it was a, the, the, maybe the last such place um, in the, in the uh, central city, which makes it so much more painful that it, was, that it ended like it did. But still, Ljubljana has quite some empty, empty places, factory slots uh, at the city outskirts. And we, at the moment, don't really know how the epidemics will, will uh, affect that. Uh, it might be a new recession, perhaps, and you know that in the recessions, usually the investments are down and you have more of these uh, uh, empty places, particularly uh, um, at the city outskirts. And the thing is that Rook offered us quite a good picture what could be uh, 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 done with these empty places and how they could be used and brought back to the, to the public city life um, by, by particular uh, communities and indig individuals on the voluntary basis. And as Ljubljana is quite a small city, uh, you don't, we don't have an endless supply of such uh, communities and individuals. And because of that, I also think it's quite, quite, uh, quite, it makes no sense that we didn't pay more attention about what functioned in Rook, uh, what could function, and how these notions from Rook could be used for other uh, empty or potentially empty spaces. So if I, if I um, uh, conclude, um, I find that the, um, the lack of this air hive or, or, or uh, information of what, what happened, what was happening in Rook or what took place in Rook uh, um, was an obstacle and um, because of that, uh, or it would be a good ground to, to uh, research what value these activities uh, generated and support it. Uh, um, uh, and, uh, and to make support uh, for them based on that. The second thing is, uh, it was good ground for Creative Center with all this diversity. And the third one is, uh, there was plenty of things we could learn for, for, for uh, bringing back into life 
other and future empty uh, spaces. So all this makes no uh, no sense. Uh, not to mention uh, how wrong was the eviction or uh, evicting people on a cold morning uh, in the middle of uh, uh, pandemics, of course. May I just uh, now say uh, just a few things about, uh, you know, drawing on what Aiden uh, just mentioned of of why why what did we not learn about Rogue, and this is probably one of the reasons. It, it's, it's probably all these reasons is are the reasons that we classify as institutional factors, you know, on uh, on why uh, Rogue uh, uh, the Rogue as a project and as a squad came to an end. And obviously, we had the, this inability to, to you know, uh, the inability to to talk to people with rogue, you know, based on based on the rigid forms of urban governance and leadership, and you know, maybe that fear of experimenting was there from the start, and uh, and that didn't really, and and maybe the project was condemned, even though it lasted 15, almost 15 years. Maybe maybe the idea was condemned even from the very start because there was always like another plan in place or maybe there wasn't there wasn't a plan from the start but there were like you know a series of plans for rogue that weren't really including this uh you know what was happening in rogue but and also but also we mentioned like you know um, you know this idea, idea of prioritizing bigger development projects, uh, the classic idea of top-down revitalization and uh, redevelopment attempts from the part of the city, which was always like one of the reasons of uh, of this extreme conflict between uh, the municipality and government and the people in Rogue and the conflicting policy priorities, you know, based uh, that that were in place and. But also we we we, have, we classified some material uh, and operational factors, and uh, especially during the end, where with the decrease in content production and uh, maybe the low morale due to the increasing legal expenses and the conflicts that emerged, you know, after a period uh, in the place. But most and most importantly, I would think. Uh, uh, the material state of the buildings and the physical restraints that people in Rogue had to work with for so many, uh, so many years it was probably one of the main reasons. Um, I mean, we have a few more uh, factors, but that I would like to discuss those with you, uh, with the, with the panel in a bit, and Kay will actually address these questions. So I don't know if Jenny wants to say a few things about the recommendations. And uh, thank you, Nikos. And briefly, after we have finished with the report and the research, we didn't want to leave things there. Naturally, we wanted to ask ourselves, so what do we do now? Do we propose something for the city, for the participants, for researchers, for anybody, really? So we, at the end of the report, you will see proposals, recommendations split in two groups, immediate actions that the city and the people of Ljubljana can take now and institutional long-term actions that can be taken for the preservation, not of, of course, not of ROG anymore, but of primarily Metelkova, because uh, if uh, you must remember from the news that there was attention after the demolition of ROG, uh, attention turned to Metilkova, police uh, visited, demolished Metilkova next was featuring on Twitter and other um, dangerous ideas um, that we thought as researchers we could, uh, of course, address with this uh, report. So briefly, immediate actions would be to recognize the value that we discuss in the report. Uh, that could be simply by mapping out more extensively than we did the content and the activities that took place through the year to the extent possible, not only for preservation reasons, but also to reflect and identify other potential activities that had value that we didn't had the chance to include in our report and then see which of the activities and the content produced we could revitalize in the future and obviously revitalize the value at, that they attracted. Uh, 
thirdly, offer experimental places from within within the city where people can participate in a bottom-up capacity experiment with social value for production with artistic content. This is something that we will definitely talk about later. Uh, fourthly, which is a bit more static but not important but not less important, offer perhaps in the Neurog Center or elsewhere during in the city, uh, a museum or an exhibition um, for the content and the history of autonomous rock so that people can visit as the Museum of Modern Art already has uh, uh, the history of Mitilkova in the, ex in the permanent exhibition, perhaps in a similar capacity if it's not too static. And um, obviously work on the preservation of Mitilkova not only from a political, social and institutional side, but also from a citizen's perspective. So in the long term, we ideally, of course, it, this will depend on the type of institution and, poli and politics that are in place. We would like to see a dynamic archive for autonomous places featuring either on the municipality or municipal or local government level, uh, which uh, we can discuss the pros and cons of this later. From my perspective as a legal scholar, I would like to discuss offering a framework for protection for autonomous places, which could be a double edged sword, because if you offer legal protection, you make them institutionalized and static and it might have the opposite effect. However, I would like to discuss the possibility that such places can be protected by the legal system, especially if they're more established, such as Mitilkova having so many years at its back. My idea would be that they could potentially be protected as part of uh, cultural heritage conventions, UNESCO uh, treaties. Uh, this is a wild idea that I'm entertaining. However, I think it holds some merit. And definitely going back to the Slovenian Supreme Court and uh, its decision and the judgment that it delivered in September 2019 with respect to Rogue, it kind of uh, touched upon the idea that uh, Rogue was operating as a public good. It was uh, had a public good. It was offering some value to the city, uh, and that was recognized by the Slovenian legal system to some to some extent. Uh, so uh, some form of protection. We can discuss what that could be. Obviously, um, the provision of long term uh, of space for long term experimentation, the experimental places that the city or the state could offer could be of a more permanent nature uh, and thus also protected and obviously offer support with link to social product uh, uh, programs and small grants for teams that want to experiment and want to offer diverse content so that they are able to fund themselves and have the space and the ability to do so. Uh, and lastly, from the more regulatory perspective, two ideas that we recommend offer some uh, minimum safety standards for autonomous places to operate without putting participants and the public in danger because one of the ongoing discussions about drug and about Mitilkov as well is to what extent is it safe to visit there uh, are there lights is the electricity is there water is the heating uh, so the material factors for the preservation of these places need to be addressed somehow and, and last but not least uh, offer some sort of alternative dispute mechanism for when classes with the municipality or the state arise as they will. Uh, prolonging and dragging the class between the squatters and the municipality has the inherent element of revolution, obviously, and it's part of squatting and it's part of being active and uh, participating and opposing and classing the system. However, if we want also to recognize the value and preserve it for the future, there should be somebody in the city, somebody uh, in local government uh, that would be able to speak to the communities on an equal basis and offer some sort of dispute mechanism. Uh, again, these are just recommendations, uh, long term recommendations, more of food for thought, and we feature them at the very end of the report, pages 57 and 58, I think, if you would like to have a look. Um, and with that in mind, I will return to Kay so we can finish uh, finish the presentation of the report and start our discussion with all of you today. Wonderful. 
Thank you, Jenny, and thank you to all three of you for just such a fascinating report. I really enjoyed reading it. I really enjoyed hearing about you talk about it and sort of hearing about the processes. I think it's a really important piece of work and I'm really glad that um, you've been doing this work. OK, so what we're going to do is move into the second part of the session, which is our panel discussion. Um, thank you very much to our panelists for joining us. Um, we have Dr. Milos Kosek, architect and critic um, and associate research fellow at the School of Arts Birkbeck at the University of London. We've got Oshka German, um, sociologist of culture and art historian in Ljubljana. We've got Nika, Dr. Nika Graba, assistant professor and researcher um, at the University of Ljubljana in the Faculty of Architecture. Dr. George Chatsunakos, um, an urban and cultural geographer and a researcher at the Policy Evaluation and Research Unit at Man Manchester Metropolitan University. And we've also got Professor Tim Edensor, Professor of Social and Cultural Geography, also at Manchester Met. So thank you all of us, all of you for giving up your evening. It's lovely to have you with us. Um, because we've got such a range of expertise, we're going to do something slightly different. I haven't got general questions for the panel. What I have got is individual questions for each panel member. So we have um, questions that are sort of targeted at taking advantage of the range of expertise that we have. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to sort of in turn ask a panelist um, their specific question and invite them to answer. And then I'm going to open up the discussion to the other panelists to comment on that answer and on that same issue. And then we'll move on to the next panelist question. So hopefully we can have a good discussion drawing on all of these different themes and um, all of these different ideas. So if we go in the order in which I introduced everyone. Um, so if we start with uh, Milos. Um, so what I wanted to ask um, you specifically is, did Autonomous ROG have characteristics of a creative centre of a city? And sort of in relation to that, are we talking about the same form or shape of creativity that the new ROG centre talks about, or is there something different going on there? Hi, hi everyone. I hope you can hear me okay. Um, due to the circumstances, I have to be in the public space quite near rock actually. <laughs> um, but I couldn't get in front of the rock to have a perfect um, uh, back view. Um, first of all, I'd like to say that the report is really valuable and that uh, this keeps rock alive as a study case as well as a maybe um, a set of lessons. Um, that aren't um, that haven't ended, but maybe have just started for other projects as well as Rock itself. Um, to address uh, your question, I think of course that very short answer would be depends whom you ask, because there are so many different creativities. It's, um, creativity is such a loaded word as well as such a nebulous one that you can. Um, use it for almost anyone, anything you want, like sustainability almost by now. And of course, it was interesting to see uh, how the media and the, um, the municipal authorities were operating with this word. One of the mo most fascinating aspects of rock is the way it was destroyed. And I think this is always, it has to be studied because some of the things that uh, perhaps are more elegantly or more clandestinely um, um, talked about usually have when they escalate they become uh, much clearer and of course um, both the users of rock as well as the municipality were talking about creativity it was interesting to see that municipality sort of a, played a, a two-level game here one was the violence on the ground, which no one disputed is, um, you know, um, is violent and um, inhumane. The other was the rhetorics of the creativity that will happen here in the future. So always when this pro problem arose, uh, municipality reverted to saying, but we will create here a great creative center um, and listed everything that will happen here. So. There was no link between the present and the bright future that was promised. 
On the other hand, of course, from the other perspective, um, one could revert this um, temporal link and saying that the um, the future actually happened in the past. The real creativity already happened and it's being destroyed by the pretext of promise of a future creativity. I mean, this, this seemingly paradox paradoxical a relationship is possible because creativity that was happening in Rook is nothing like um, the creative um, industries and completely mainstream neoliberal economies that are um, that were envisaged in what that are envisaged still in what is supposed to become the new Rook. And I think that here at this point one asks oneself um, definitely we did not know um, the no one actually thought about the wealth and the variety of actions in rock while it was happening but perhaps knowing it um created its destruction in a way i think that the the interesting element of rock is that in some of its functions like uh, things that i didn't already mention so um forming uh, a space and framework for both uh, issues like um, connected to race citizens, to migrants, as well as to drug users. It did something that the state and municipality didn't. And in sort of a usurped the role of the state um, in what I would not claim is so much alternative fashion, but completely mainstream fashion. So one could also read the destruction of Rock through it, it going much too far away from alternative zone into into the empty void that the state and municipality did not fulfill. So in that way, and then I'll conclude because I'm afraid I'm a little bit too long, but in that way, and since I'm an architect, I feel that the seeds of Rogue's destruction were somehow already sown with the big wall that surrounds it. In a way, the big wall obviously served as a protection um, most obviously in the 2016 eviction, and perhaps it would do its job in 2021 as well, if more people would be in the role. But on the other hand, I think that the it we could all also see the lesson of rock in a sense that it was too closed. Not, not in a sense that people did not have um, access to it, because groups of people had access to it that couldn't enter into any of the other ostensibly public spaces, but in a sense that it tried to a way of existing in a sort of a gentleman's agreement with the mainstream outside. And I think that the ultimate condition of Rome to throw away those walls itself expect into the city. So was for granted the protection zone and stopped um, the post alternative more like the municipality or the state and I think I'll conclude here yeah thank you brilliant thank you um that was a really rich answer. So before we kind of move on to another question um, or anyone else's question, I just wanted to invite the other members of the panel. Is there anyone who wants to come in and comment on the same question or on any of Milosh's kind of pro provocations, any of the think any of the thinking in that answer? Would anyone like to jump in um, and and uh, and sort of extend that discussion at all? Uh, Milos, thank you very much for bringing the imagery of the wall into the discussion mm -hmm. because Nikos and I have experienced the wall being shot at night at Rock to exclude drug users, the wall opening to invite people for uh, activities and the, the, the demolition of part of the wall in 2016 was not only symbolic, it was very real, but also symbolic in that it starts the demise of of, of rock, so yeah, it, it needed the architect's perspective to bring the material <laughs> elements of symbolism into the discussion. It's a very powerful uh, idea, I think, uh, uh, what the, mm. the surrounding wall is and was. So thank mm. you for bringing. Mm. Uh, can I just add something? Um, yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, 
I just now remembered on what uh, David Harvey once wrote on actually um, experimenting practices in um, urban environment that often actually they need certain enclosure to be able to happen at all. So this is um, just um, a short uh, response. Mm -hmm. True, yes. Um, yeah, Milos, did you want to come back on that? And I know Nika, I think you yeah, wanted um, to come in as well. Yeah, I, I, can... I, um, I, I very much agree. Oh, sorry, um, let, let me just quickly respond to Urshka. I very much agree. There is a new practice that um, cannot evolve. Um, sorry, this is a Slovene. Public space as well. I think <laughs> new practices. Sorry. I think we've lost. I think you're uh, cutting out. Is, is that just is there you? Or? Yeah. A is bad connection. Yeah. Okay. You want to try again? Um, is it any better or? It's cutting in and out um, a little can you bit. Hear me now? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, then maybe maybe uh, no, I think we've lost you again. And, uh, um, yeah, let's have Nika and then we'll see if it comes back in. But yeah, Nika, if I could invite you. Yes, hopefully my wireless works, but if it doesn't show me and then I'll switch to a different wireless network. Maybe I wanted to um, continue with what Milos was was actually saying. Um, so the the real I think that one thing uh, that uh, has to be recognized that really rock is not a typical squat, which mm -hmm. then also kind of to an extent um, uh, gives more explanation to why and how it ended. So you know the the fact that it was agreed with the municipality that the people use that space uh, does not like. Um, you know, say that rock was actually a squad. So when we are saying we destroyed rock and we, um, you know, did not recognize the value, I, I think it's important to really go into who the we and who we did not mm -hmm. recognize, etc. So I believe that it was recognized by the court that there was a public good. So um, we destroyed rock really goes into um, who destroyed the buildings first. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, it was a decision that was made by one person and it was done in a very problematic way until to Day, we have not seen any documents on the basis of which the demolition took place. It was a very problematic situation of how this was done with the police or with the private um, security, et cetera, et cetera, and the way this was listed and the whole propaganda that um, then turned around afterwards. So I think this is very important uh, to consider because I think that it was recognized. Uh, we as a society, mm -hmm did recognize the, the value, um, whereas a person did not decide, de decided not mm -hmm. to um, really um, follow the follow the procedures that as a public institution should be done. So, and I think that the violence that resulted from that is something that we really should keep in mind and we should never accept. So, mm -hmm. um, holding people in res rep responsible for this particular action I think is most important because if we see it here today we will see it again and this is unacceptable especially for the conditions in which a rock evolved uh, and how uh, all these processes uh, un you know uh, unfolded um, but what I think uh, is very important and what I think is key Okay, and it was also a part of the internal problem of Rog and also of Metelkova, even though I think these are two different cases. Um, can you hear me or am I breaking? Yeah. Yes, you can hear me. So uh, the, the thing is that um, the context, um, we have to recognize that actually all the mechanisms of development uh, that we have in place uh, you know, through the city municipality and so on, and that have changed in the 90s, uh, really are based on carbon economy that in itself mm -hmm. is very problematic. So actually, 
we have a very problematic city management situation. So therefore we are in a state of systemic crisis as it is, you know, mm. the development of cities. So um, th this fact is then visible because actually the development of cities is producing problems for people of different sorts, mm -hmm. for different activities, et cetera, et cetera. So therefore, Borok was just very big and it was there from the beginning of the 90s. And, um, you know, it actually showed many different, a myriad of problems that we can relate to this situation. So as it was said in the Department of Arts, in the social, you know, arena, et cetera, et cetera. So, but the real, the realization that actually we are in a state of systemic crisis, you know, we don't have the legal um, measurement to solve this stuff. Um, really, there needs to be a realization that we need to open possibility of solidarity for working together, for allowing people to help each other, to be creative, et cetera, et cetera. And these autonomous zones in such a context should be uh, recognized as a value in themselves. But because the municipality and the system as such, well, it's not the system, the system is not going to say, uh, anything, you know, it's the people that have to realize that they are having a problem with the system. So we as people would have to realize that we are having a problem with the system and therefore recognize this as a value. And therefore a political decision mm -hmm. or, or systemic change or decisions could be could be taken. So um, I think that Rook just really manifested this in a very big way because it was big. And the way it ended i don't think that it actually ended i think that people of rook are still very active and what held it pinned down to a certain location and created also a problem of how to work together uh is actually now very violently you know put to a stop but the, at the same time the people who were involved i think are still active and have to go beyond this is what Milos was saying you know the walls you know, so in in this in this metaphorical or symbolic way, uh, this kind of idea of rock is like splashing <laughs> over <laughs> the wall. <laughs> you know, Can I also add something to this? What Nika said now and related still um, back to Milos and his uh, mentioning um, the wall. You know, I know that also um, a group of people. Um, are now really bringing the um, activities and approaches from the Rook Factory in a, let's say, rhizomatic way to other mm -hmm. institutions. So there is a group of people uh, which is very active in the frame mm -hmm. of Faculty of Social Sciences. Uh, they got a certain platform there um, for different kind of activities. So in that way, um, yeah, as Nika said, uh, Rook activities continue in, in different formats. and. Yeah, entering also different institutions. Mm. Um, I think that's a really good point to um, pose my second question, which is actually for you, Ushka. I really like the idea of this, these kind of rhizomatic movements um, and also the kind of all of the discussions have touched on a kind of temporality, a past, a present and future and the kind of institutional forms that the future kind of promises and the limitations of this. Um, and sort of in relation to that, I wanted to talk about um, Autonomous ROG and the, the new space of this new ROG center. So what would be the difference between the production space that Autonomous ROG um, offered and the production space that the new ROG center will offer? And is there any place, thinking about these um, both rhizomatics and temporalities, is there any place for old ROG in the new ROG? Is, how, how do they relate, if at all? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, yeah, thank you also for the invitation. Maybe I uh, should also a bit contextualize. I guess also one of the reasons for my invitation, um, I was also part of this European project, uh, Second Chance, that is also mentioned in, the, in your report. Um, but uh, trying to respond um, to your um, question, um, I'm afraid uh, there will not be much connection. I mean, if we put aside the pure fact that um, a city is claiming that the new rock center will be 
a production facility in the field of culture and that already the first um, users of uh, Rook Factory back in 2006 um, claimed the need for production spaces in the field of culture in Ljubljana and were addressing this need by occupying and starting to use Rook Factory. I don't think there, there will be much connection. Mm -hmm. Um, I saw the last possibility for, let's say, bridging um, and trying to connect the city plans and more self-organized way. Um, so um, connecting uh, in a way that would be more um, equal, um, participatory and collaborative. I saw the last possibility um, still in what kind of management plan this new institution will, um, will have. And uh, because the city decided this spring uh, in a very fast manner to establish a very classical public institution, um, I don't see any more possibility for, uh, let's say, opening um, yeah, ways, doors, um, walls, um, for uh, really a more collaborative um, way of um, and and uh, participatory way uh, between and collaboration between city plans and uh, self-organized uh, initiatives, groups, organization, and so on. Um, so um, uh, we have, for example, uh, an example. In Zagreb, um, it's called Polygon uh, Culture and Youth Center. It was founded uh, by the um, uh, city of Zagreb and coalition of culture and youth organizations back in 2008. And this is a model of public civic uh, partnership. And I thought uh, somehow Rook uh, could also offer and develop uh, this kind of new model of public civic partnership. And for example, so we have in our really neighborhood country an example which is already more than 10 years uh, lasting and where we can learn from and derive from and uh, develop further. And it's an interesting case. Um, so um, this cultural center, it's public in, uh, infrastructure basically founded and managed together by the city of Zagreb and coalition of different organizations from the field of youth work and culture. And actually this model enables um, really uh, sustainability by on one side um, 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 public actually um, publicly funding, uh, financing and also um, supervision on one hand, but then also independent programming and participatory decision making on the other. So this is one model, for example, of a possible uh, civic uh, pu public partnership. Um, but instead in Ljubljana, we got a classical um, um, public institution and in your report you um, underline very much the danger of top-down um, development and management also of uh, creative centers and um, I'm afraid uh, this new public institution um, will for sure, um, I mean for sure it will also uh, develop different partnerships you know but uh, I'm afraid and in pretty much top-down way uh, under the conditions set by this public institution, you know, and this is very different than, for example, this um, uh, case from Zagreb where um, decision making and programming is participatory and autonomous. Um, and uh, yeah, so um, in that sense, I see the danger that this new institution will be um, very much uh, curated one, you know, in the way of understanding curating um, very much connected to authorship. So claiming, uh, you know, we are the ones which, which make this um, instead of uh, understanding of curating um, in its original etymology, which means caring, you know, basically curating, it's a practice of care. Mm -hmm. And, um, but yeah, so I'm afraid this new institution um, will, will not follow um, this, 
uh, meaning of, of the of the term of curating and also yes it's it's a question um uh if and under what kind of conditions different um contents programs uh, uh, services activities that were very important in um, rock autonomous rock factory like social work um, if they will find uh, space also in the new uh, center, which claims very much, uh, you know, uh, covering the field of architecture, design, visual art. Um, but, you know, I think um, these times of monoculture institutions are over. We are living really in a very complex times and we need also, uh, that's why, um, complex, more complex models of management for, of those public institutions um, that would, uh, you know, connect different people, uh, connect different disciplines, and especially um, open, actually, um, open possibility that this diversity can thrive. Um, mm -hmm. But, uh, yeah, I'm afraid this will not be the case now. Mm -hmm. That was a fantastic answer. I feel like you've taken us from ROG to a much kind of deeper theoretical and sort of quite challenging set of questions. I have a question for Nika that relates to that, but before that, I just wanted to open up to the panel. Does anyone want to comment on um, what Oshka said? If not, I'll move into Nika. Okay, Nika, I wanted to ask you, and I think this relates to Ershka's answer, um, especially sort of the talking about diversity um, and um, all of the different kind of groups involved, perhaps not so much the, um, the sort of civic partnerships and um, public partnerships and things like that. But I wanted to ask you specifically about social groups and which social groups benefit from autonomous zones and what's the importance of this and why does this matter more than it did say 30 years ago? Um, I think it would be very difficult to, to generalize which mm -hmm. social groups benefit but I would like to maybe um, you know in the case of Rok, um, we would see many different social groups there. Mm. Uh, so, of course, it's uh, <laughs> one thing that's very important is that there are people who are just actually ready to claim space. I think that's more important, like the, the political activity, mm -hmm. is like being engaged and who mm -hmm. that those people are it depends on their interests. But unfortunately, it's also uh, we with what happens in these autonomous zones is what actually the city is not addressing. So um, these autonomous zones are actually a mirror to to the city policy, I would say, to a large extent, and to the needs of the people. But not mm -hmm. only in terms of problems, but also in terms of creativity. For example, you know the circus, the types of people, you know, just philosophizing, people being into literature, et cetera, et cetera. But that's one aspect of it, uh, you know, the social problems and then the creative uh, ideas. But then what I think is a common den denominator in these people that is really about taking a place to yourself, uh, you know, this mm -hmm. kind of action that you want to manifest it and that you want to be together. And so I think that with Rook, it was always very clear that it's about political engagement, you know, and, and making a statement and claiming that place. And, and it was, you know, how they worked. It was not just activities. It was about, you know, having discussions about it. So, that uh, so it, there was always this idea present with all is, its ups and we also have to say downs there were many downs also and it would be very interesting to see the history of problems of political engagement in Slovenia mm -hmm. from the 90s to today um, but one thing that uh, at the same time because there is this big word looming over all this um, such situation it's the word gentrification so uh, in this particular case, uh, who benefits in this uh, whole unfolding of rock is, okay, we always say these social groups kind of benefited because they were able to use that space and they were able to uh, have activities there for a long time and therefore they were, um, that would be the critique privileged in relation to other social groups. 
uh, that did not claim that space, mm -hmm. that did not want to be political, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But what we tend to uh, overlook is that actually that the fact that Rug was in this condition for so long actually benefited other social groups. Uh, that sold and resold that land and that really made a lot of money out of it and it was just very useful for them and those are you know not these excluded but very very much um, the, the policy makers or um, managers of, of this property so there is always this double side um, but what I wanted to say is that, of course, uh, we can link it to gentrification, but it's also a problematic turn because it doesn't take us anywhere. So I think it's also very useful when we're talking about such processes to not only pro say it's a problem, but also to just see uh, who profits uh, from this gentrification mm -hmm. the most. And uh, the thing is that we do have institutions that are supposed to kind of uh, uh, downplay these processes and we have all the institutions that all the societies uh, that could work really nicely but the fact is that they're not doing their job so if the municipality is really accelerating these processes mm -hmm. then they should be ready for the critique uh, and uh, why is this so important now uh, more than it was 30 years ago? Because there are certain processes that started 30 years ago and it was not so manifested. And actually really Rook manifests this very well because the idea of Rook was really to have a bottom-up institution really also to talk about cultural issues. And so I'm going to have this um, parallel with Metelkova because it's a different kind of situation mm -hmm. and like going to the wall, etc. It's very important to recognize this kind of what we're saying, autonomous zones and the, the themes that they're opening up. And so with Metelkova schist, which is the problem that you we we're, we're talking about at the, at the moment there was this borderline between Metilkova autonomous zone and the ministry of culture not or the official um, um, Metilkova square where the the, the, the museums are etc so it was this NGO culture that was bridging the official culture mm -hmm. policy or the problematic, uh, you know, and 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 between the autonomous zone, but that's like owned by by the by the, by the Ministry of Culture. Whereas that was like agreed, like Metilkova was given this. They are they are not uh, heritage, but they are protected, you know, as such. It's it's written there that there should be there is a place for alternative culture. Mm -hmm. Whereas the Druk, no such thing exists. It was just an agreement. It was really about claiming space. Uh, and and having a place to experiment and, and to navigate this politics also. So I think it's a very different situation. But what we're losing with this um, with this is really um, where do we see these problems, you know, and where do we see how people engage and what how do we see what they talk about? This is a very important problem that we're overlooking and we will not have, uh, you know, really think about where do you discuss this we as society are missing an opportunity to really for people to come out to show what the problems are whereas we know that development models that we have on our hands are really not working so i think this mm -hmm. is the biggest um you know loss but at the same time the realization that this is important is uh, making people go further and have these initiatives that we have already started and i think are going to enrich future future talks about it thank you I, again i'm just really enjoying the kind of richness of, of all of the answers as as you have been talking i've been thinking about the different kind of institutions that are exercising power um in relation to what you're talking about be it the courts or the municipality and how different um uh, different forms of regulation are occurring, which I, I would um, kind of think about because uh, I work in a law school. Um, but what I want to do now is um, bring in um, Tim Edensor, if that's OK, um, and to ask um, one of the conclusions of the report is the ongoing suppression 
and the controlling of forms of experimentation in the urban context, which I think speaks exactly to what Nico was talking about. And this thus creates specific imaginaries for cities. However, the counter argument is that experimental public places and spaces do not exactly offer value to the city or to the broader public. How should these spaces operate in order to gain a continuous legitimacy and to create opportunities for, again, coming back to what Nico was talking about, to create opportunities for inclusive participation or inclusive citizen participation? So just a, a small well, question. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, no, well, I'll, we'll answer it in a kind of idiosyncratic way as well. So the first thing I want to say is about space and about these kinds of informal spaces that occur in cities. And I think there's two things that we need to grasp when we think about the neoliberal city and how, it, how these informal spaces that, that are then adopted in these temporary ways <clears throat> produce. And I think the first thing that I want to say is that they nearly all uh, produce through speculation. So large property concerns own these places, but they wait and they wait until they're prime and when they're until they're ripe for exploitation, for maybe renting, for building. And that can be a long time. That can be 20 years. It can be it can be longer. It can be even longer. Uh, and I did some work a, a few years ago about looking at industrial ruins across Britain. And it was amazing how many of these ruins had lingered for very, very many years. And of course, people go into them and they use them. Uh, but so it, to actually bypass that is really difficult. But the second thing, and it's kind of related to that, is that city management and also these these sort of speculators like to create an, a, a, a notion of terra nullius. That is, they want to produce a space where nothing exists, but where a, a development can be imagined. And so with, given those two kind of conditions, it can be quite hard in, in a sense, even though as um, as uh, uh, Aidan said, there is no lack of such spaces in the city. There is a proliferation of informal spaces all over the city. And I'm, I'm looking at one in Manchester at the moment with two colleagues, Pomona Island, um, which, is a, which is a sort of large informal area, but which is absolutely controlled by developers, which is not to say, of course, that lots of things don't take place there, that it's... That it's, that it's um, ex used in all sorts of different ways. Okay, so then what I want to do is I want to say two main things, having contextualised the discussion uh, in, in a sort of geographical way, I guess, is that I've, and I mentioned this uh, to Jenny earlier, is that I've always really been influenced by uh, Alberto Malucci's book, No Man to the Present, when he talks about new social movements. So this kind of, his, his, he identifies new social movements as having four essential qualities, all of which I think kind of fit uh, the experiments at ROG. So first of all, and very importantly, they're non-hierarchical. So because they're not sort of uh, in instrumentally organised, no, there's no kind of, nobody says who can be there, who can't be there. They, they tend to be kind of very inclusive. And so this non-hierarchical quality, of course, allows all sorts of things to happen. But of course, as we've already heard, it has its disadvantages. Secondly, they're experimental. So nothing is laid down. There's no kind of uh, um, uh, idea about what should happen. Rather, they kind of emerge in process. And so that processual, uh, those, those processual activities are kind of really essential. The second, the third thing that he says, and this is kind of really, really important, I think, and this is going to bring me on to the point that I want to make, is that they're transient. They are inherently transient. So the activity, people come together, they disperse. Different groups, different networks assemble in different spaces, and, and then maybe they go elsewhere, or maybe they disperse, and a whole series of different groups come together. So these in these kind of temporary alignments, and this sounds exactly what's happened uh, at Rob as well, and it changes. Different people come, and then others leave. So that transience is really important. And then the fourth thing that he, that he says, which I think is really important, is that they're not necessarily these these uh, experimental new social movements or, or, or activist spaces are not necessarily about producing something as part of a long-term vision. Rather, they're about self-actualization in the here and now. They're about changing the self now, in the moment, about attempting experimental sort of ways of social living at this very moment. So not necessarily as part of some sort of, I don't know, Marxist utopia in the future, for instance, to, to draw an obvious uh, parallel, but about now. Uh, and so, 
I suppose the thing that I want to really kind of emphasise is that I think this transience is really good. So the question that you're asking all the time is, what can we learn? How can, how can we institute a kind of memory? How can we fix this place? No, we don't want to fix the place. The whole point is that it should never be fixed, but it should rather be about the kind of emergence of a place that is dynamic, that is, that is not ossified, but endlessly comes into being. Uh, and, and, and the point that I want to make then, and, and sort of related to this, is that there are, as we've already said, lots of informal spaces right across the city, and all sorts of things take place in these, in these informal settings all the time. Uh, and, and but we don't necessarily see them. They've kind of, a lot of them are kind of invisible. But there is this kind of dynamism, and there's no attempt to institutionalise this. So what I would urge you to think about is how we reject that kind of institutionalisation. And if things are to be archived and remembered and curated, then they're done in the kind of inventive, inventive and very kind of <laughs> kind of non-hierarchical and unofficial way. Um, and then the second thing, and so this also is a sort of geographical point, which I'll just make very briefly, is that there's a danger here also of setting up the kind of autonomous zone, this kind of experimental alternative space, against everyday space that is not apparently seen as alternative, right? But actually, all sorts of things take place in the city, in the, not necessarily in its kind of apparently designated autonomous or informal zone, but actually can take place on the wing uh, in, through sorts of all sorts of temporary uh, experimentations and can be incredibly powerful and can take place. So can take and make place. So, I mean, I'll just say that what I'll do is I've just had a paper accepted in social and cultural geography, and it's about this gorilla sculpture, a kind of memorial that was installed in Melbourne, in this park in Melbourne. Nobody knows who put it there but the locals absolutely came to love it and they organised all sorts of creative activities and interpretations and image making around it. And this is not in an informal space. This is in a kind of an, an official park. So just be aware of, of, of drawing too fine a distinction between the informal space where autonomous and alternative things take place and the rest of the city. So I'll, I'll just leave it there. I think apart from anything else, that poses a brilliant challenge to kind of the report sources because you talked about a ROG museum and memorialization. Um, how do we memorialize in a non-hierarchical way, Jenny? <laughs> that, that's exactly my point through. because I, I understand the value of, of uh, emergent transient social movements, but <laughs> whose job and whose responsibility from an institutional political perspective is to provide the emergent conditions because at least mm. for the case of Ljubljana we see this constant opposition from the part of the municipality and the constant fight mm. and we want to make sure that at least in the background the institutions not cooperate but at mm. least are appreciative and this is why we talk about the value of these places here so whose job would it be very plainly put at the end of the day to ensure that in in our city be it official, semi-official, or autonomous, there, there are the emergent conditions for all of the, for all of this activity to emerge. That was an actual question for everyone wants to answer. Yeah, <laughs> I will think about that up to the panel. <laughs> it's a great question. The thing is, though, with the how what it sounds from what you're saying is that the that Rob included a vast array of different people who came in at different times. So nobody owned it or everybody owned it. So that, that very non-hierarchical quality makes it really difficult to kind of make that. So I, I suppose what I would say is that in order to do something like that, it has to be kind of impressionistic and multivocal. It, it can only ever be polyvocal and it can't be about, it can't be very organisational, but it's got to be somewhat chaotic. Maybe it even has to kind of transcend, you know, narrative. Mm. Maybe it has to be wholly impressionistic and, and, and non-narrativized in a kind of creative writing way. I don't know. Poetry. Mm -hmm. um, Aidan, Aidan, do you want to jump in? Yeah, yeah. Um, and I, I, I'll talk about uh, a few sentence discussion we had with Urska a couple of days ago. So Urska, please interrupt me whenever, whenever you feel <laughs> feel like that, because I'm going to use some of your sentences. 
uh, but you remembered me on a couple of months ago. Uh, there was there was uh, this uh, article in one of the newspaper, and it said some people of Rook had found have found a new place on the east side of the uh, city fringe, and this place. Uh, uh, um, with, I talk about Saturnus factory, it's close to, to Moste, Spansky Borci area, uh, uh, the border between Moste and uh, Zelena Yama. However, uh, the response uh, from the system or the municipality was, okay, we are aware of that, we're going to secure the, 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 the venue with the security. So what I'm saying is, yeah, let's not get too much into into uh, um, uh, the how experimental places should be provided, uh, but but maybe to lower um, the approach on uh, let's not protect the places without any kind of content uh, 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 for not not being used by 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 someone who actually uh, a proof that that can deliver some value that can uh, 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 develop some contents. Yeah. Nika? Yes, I wanted to add to this very um, legal, maybe, <laughs> there are people here. So right now, what we have at our disposal when dealing with planning space, we have public space and we have private space. Mm. No in between. So uh, there is, you know, there are other approaches when trying to navigate this. And I think that in Ljubljana, especially, we don't have these procedures at place so even if the municipality not i'm not saying that they were really trying hard you know <laughs> but even if they wanted to uh legally i don't think mm -hmm. they could actually and it was always present with the rock community and also the fringes within that you know there was this discursive element of how they were talked about or addressed saying you know they were uh, like marginalized people, marginalized groups, etc. And they were like, "We're not ma marginalized, you know. We're we're not poor. We're not like we we just are." So just this fact of this this course, uh, the 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 difference of this course, mm -hmm. just made it impossible for them to engage because for the municipality people to really. <laughs> talk their language, they would have to reframe the way they saw it, and which they couldn't from the positions that they were in. And from the side of the rock community, if they started their language, they were critiqued by the rock community that they're selling, you know, selling yeah. out. So this discursive, um, you know, situation is really symptomatic. But uh, what I, I mean, we talked about this on many meetings that there should be a different legal legal framing of the term space you know the community space just to, to to have different principles at work when you're dealing with a community in in public space and actually we should in in city centers actually in the city we should um basically just um demand i think i believe we should demand community spaces um in, uh, for example, a certain percentage of public spaces should be community spaces and there should be like ways in which the municipality engages with communities mm. of different sorts to allow for these experiments that you were talking about. Mm. So, um, I mean, there, there is research done about this and of course, I mean, still there is going to be squads and different kind of, you know, people are just going to claim um, their, their space. Uh, but, you know, how that is met and how that is seen and what we learn from that, that is only about like people and seeing the problems of the system in this, you know. So, um, obviously, going violently into the situation does not is not something that we would like to see in the future. Mm. I think that's a brilliant challenge to lawyers as well and to lawyers to think creatively about what needs to be done and perhaps to legal geographers as well. I mean, do we need to uh, rediscover the, um, I mean, I'm talking more about English law, I suppose, but the idea of the commons. Um, I'm going to invite Tim to speak and then I have a final question for George. So we'll take Tim and then George, you will uh, kind of bring us to a close. Tim. Yeah, really, it's just a, a thing about this kind of legal status. So when I was doing my work on industrial ruins, I traveled the length and breadth of the United Kingdom. And I must have gone to about 150 disused and derelict factories, mills and foundries 
and nearly every single one had a little fence around it. And mm -hmm. there, was, there was always a thing that said trespassers would be prosecuted, guard dogs, uh, you know, patrolling these premises. Except, in reality, local kids had always found a way in. And so I followed the local kids to get into these properties, and there were never any consequences at all. So in a sense, the, although these, there were these statements about kind of legal protection of these, of these premises, none of them actually were. And it, on the rare occasions that I did meet security guards, they were just glad of the company. And they certainly didn't want to send me off away. They liked to chat. So it's, it's, there's a kind of a really interesting thing where there might be this kind of quasi-legal uh, 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 private space that isn't allowed to be entered. But in reality, it can be entered. And so the point that I'm making is that people did enter these places and they carried out all sorts of creative and interesting mm. social things. Mm. Thank you. Um, I would like to hear very much more about that research. It sounds like a brilliant project. Um, let's talk more. Um, but I'm going, I'm aware of time, so I'm going to move to my final question, which is for George. Thank you for your patience as we've moved around to you. Um, so what I want to pose to you, George, is um, the story of ROG is partially highlighting the inherent difficulties of sustaining momentum um, in squats and autonomous places in general, which we talked about at length already. It can be argued that multiple parameters contribute to this, such as activist fatigue, financial constraints and relationships with the general public. So in your role as an activist academic and based on your research experience, why do you think such actions fail if they fa fail? And what actions can be done to reinvigorate the concept of squatting in the public sphere's perception? Um, I'm just going to unmute you, George. I hope you can hear me right now. Yes, we can. Thank can you. you. Yes, yes, for sure. Can you hear me? Okay. okay. Yes. <laughs> so yes, uh, Michelle, I would like to thank you very much uh, for the invitation to this panel. And uh, I also would like to congratulate, you, uh, congratulate uh, my friends and uh, colleagues from Manchester for uh, publishing this uh, report. I really enjoyed uh, reading it. Uh, I will share with you some stuff uh, from, I, I don't uh, research per se uh, squads, but uh, I do carry with me some empirical knowledge as I have been living to some squads in, uh, in Europe, mainly in Greece, uh, Spain and France. Uh, so my knowledge uh, stems mainly from, uh, from European uh, squad, uh, the European squatting movement. Uh, but uh, I would like to share with you, while I have been reading the report, uh, I, found, I, I thought that the, the story of Rock is uh, not a unique one. So I, I traced, uh, I traced uh, many, many, many matters that uh, concerns uh, squats uh, probably globally. We can see similar cases all across Europe. But uh, returning to the question, uh, in my view, Rock uh, has not failed uh, per se. Some squatting projects are short lived, whereas others might live for decades. But the precariousness is uh, synonymous uh, to squatting. And this is, uh, to a certain extent, something good because living in a squad is, a, is an ongoing experiment that challenges individual, individualistic forms of, of living and ways of socializing. And this is uh, this in the neoliberal city is quite uh, something important. And here is also the value that uh, you also recognize. Uh, in this uh, regard, uh, for 15 years, ROC uh, have, have been functioning as a hub of opposition against the mainstream economic, political, cultural and social manifestations of urban life, as you note in the report, and this is something valuable, something has been produced over uh, over 15 years. And I guess may, I have never been to Slovenia, but I guess uh, many people will have passed uh, from the doors of the specific squad. So on the one hand, the value of the squad lies, especially in the fact that they are not officially recognized by politicians, policymakers, the mass media, urban developers, but also something very important is that, is that they are neglected by the mainstream narration of the creative city. And this is exactly because squatting, uh, and this is exactly because squatting seems like a practical and immediate alternative to capitalism in everyday life. So on the other hand, as you mentioned in your report, they enhance creatively cities in many ways. And this is something that we have already discussed. So usually outsiders and especially journalists are rarely aware of the continuous exhibitions, concerts, workshops, talks, and other ways of socializing.
Jason Foster by essentially uh, 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 stereotypes as uh, of the squatters as young radicals. Uh, we have to note here that most of the squads uh, are open places for many different people who want to practice something. Who want, they want to practice culture, the, uh, this sort of culture that uh, that is not uh, open and accessible uh, from, especially in the city centers. And this is uh, a crucial squads have a crucial con contribu contribution in this regard to social justice, equality, and local uh, democracy. But uh, also, I uh, would like to note here that we have to acknowledge uh, that there are many different of squatters and squats. Their needs and impacts uh, can be accordingly very different, right? So one of the primary errors uh, that we usually do, not only us, but also the mainstream, the top-down uh, approaches, is to pack them all under the same social category. I will not expand further on this diversity, but when we speak about the squatter movement, we don't deal with some type of squatting, squatting that has a reactionary character. So far-right squads, drug gangs who occupy buildings are not part of the squatting movement. So when, therefore, when we speak about the squatters movement, uh, we ought to address and crystallize those projects that promote collective direct action, self-management and communitarian lifestyle that indeed challenge capitalist urbanization, housing speculation. But all these issues, collective action, self-management, I think we lost George. George, I think we might have lost you, um, which is disappointing because uh, that was brilliant and you were um, mid making a fantastic point. Yeah, I think George has fully frozen. <laughs> um, okay. What I am aware, though, is that um, we have come to time. It is 6.30. So what I'm going to do is just, um, if anyone wants to make any final brief comments, um, please do jump in now. Uh, if anyone wants to respond to the first part of what George was saying, please do. Or if there's any final comments about anything we've discussed today or the report. I, I wanted to just, uh, rep I mean, rep in, in relation to what George was saying, yes, I uh, think it's also re important to recognize that all these uh, community or squat or uh, however, alternative experimental uh, places are not necessarily democratic places, even though we like to, you know, see them as such always. So, yeah. Oshka? Yeah, I was also thinking now. Um, <laughs> maybe uh, George, you would like to conclude your, and then I I continue. Yes, I, I think it's logical when speaking about crossing. <laughs> so yes, uh, what I, uh, in order to. What I wanted to say is that living in a squad, especially in a squad, you do more things than organizing debates and concerts. So life in the squad is a of a long party. This can be a very tiring process. Interaction works, management issues regarding uh, the building and the legal affairs. Most importantly, the relationship between the community and many other issues that they are related to the everyday life of the squad. And another important issue is the weekly assembly. I think to squads that the, the, the assembly has, has been taking five hours per day in three different languages, for example. But there's, and also from. Oh, I think we've lost George again. <laughs> um, okay, Oshka, would you like to jump in? Yeah, um, I was just. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thinking of terminology um, <laughs> now. Um, Nika was already uh, bringing up this uh, question if Rook was squat at all. Now we are concluding this discussion um, about the uh, relevance of squats um, for the um, um, cities and uh, life, uh, public life. Um, I mean, since 
I was also thinking about that when I was reading the report because the beginnings of rogue um, um, occupation um, were actually claimed as a temporary use. Uh, then the agreement with the municipality did not um, happen. Um, and so somehow uh, because of this failed uh, uh, possibility or, um, or failed agreement, um, Basically, um, more and more often, uh, Rook was also um, described as a squad. Um, maybe, I don't know, maybe uh, this is not so important, but I guess because this is academic context, the terminology matters, I don't know. Um, but I was thinking uh, if uh, self-organized spaces uh, uh, or space in case of rock is maybe more relevant, I don't know. And then uh, also thinking of the reasons of um, um, uh, of, of problems and declining uh, um, uh, uh, rogue activities. I mean, putting aside the, the most obvious, of course, the, the, the exhaustion from the side of the city uh, administration um, and the hard conditions under which uh, community people had to work for 15 years, um, not reaching out for any kind of support. Um, I think the question of size uh, also matters here. Um, it was several times mentioned uh, that the Rook uh, factory is a huge complex. And uh, I think to manage it really in a, in a way that is claimed under this principle of uh, self-organized, inclusive, mm -hmm. participatory, non-hierarchical, what we also heard, um, um, a space, uh, democratic space, I think this uh, 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 question of size also uh, mattered here because it was, I think, too big to be able to really um, um, somehow, um, yeah, uh, bring uh, the, the principles um, all the time uh, um, and therefore sure in life and therefore sure also certain high, high monopolizations, hierarchies uh, developed and so on. So maybe it's also a question of size and the scale um, that it's also uh, an issue for the problems of the uh, Rook community. Thank you. I think that's kind of a provocation to further research and a provocation to thinking about these issues of size and scale uh, in relation to rock and elsewhere. We have run over by eight minutes, uh, for which I apologise, that is bad chairing on my part. Um, but what I would like to do is finish here. Um, but before I do, I want to say thank you so much for the report um, and to the panellists for just such thoughtful and insightful engagement with the questions that we've asked. I have learned so much. Um, I, you've given me a lot of food for thought um, to take into my own work. Um, I hope that everybody else has uh, taken the same from this session. Um, and yes, it just remains to say thank you once again. It's been wonderful. Thank you. Thank you very Thank much you. for coming and bringing the report to life, everyone. And hopefully see you in Ljubljana when the <laughs> when international flights uh, are able to resume. Yeah, please let Thank us you. know. Let us know when you come. And Thank you for the event and uh, good good luck. All the best. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you. Thank you for uh, participating. <laughs> Thank you for your time.